Okay, it's 10 o'clock. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, logging on to this hour's discussion. Uh, you're very, very welcome indeed. It's good to, to have you with us. My name, for those that don't know, is Louise Kingham, and I am the Chief Executive of the Energy Institute. And it's with the grateful thanks for the organisation from our Scottish branches and networks that we are bringing this uh, hour's event to you this morning. Um, I'd also like to say a very warm thank you to our sponsors for today, who are IBM, Repsol Cinepec, SSE and Neptune Energy. Welcome everyone. So the focus for today is to explore a new context actually for energy in Scotland and from two really, really important perspectives. One of those is about creating a more just and equal society uh, for Scotland and for communities and consumers, and one is about building on the fantastic industrial story of the UK continental shelf and describing a possible new energy future for Scotland that will, of course, benefit the entire UK. And of course, all of this is against, obviously, the backdrop of what we have all been living through in terms of the global pandemic and its impacts on our lives and our, the economies in which we operate. So I'm joined today by two fantastic speakers who are going to give you some great presentations. I've been lucky enough to have a little bit of a preview to both of them, and I'll, I'll introduce them to you in a second. And of course, once you've heard from, from both speakers, you're going to have the opportunity to pose your questions to them too, so that we may have time for some discussion towards the end of the hour. And uh, if you want to do that, by all means, please just pop your question into the chat box. You can make some choices about who that goes to. If you don't want absolutely everyone to see it, you can direct it towards a presenter. And I'll keep an eye on that and endeavour to ask as many time for during the course of uh, this morning's event. So without further ado, um, let me introduce you to Jim Ski. Jim Ski is Professor Jim Ski, currently co-chair of Working Group 3 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And this one, this intergovernmental panel covers mitigation of climate change methods for reducing emissions of greenhouse gases and also enhancing, I'm very sorry, that keeps uh, keeps going off, and enhancing uh, the, the opportunities for <laughs> improvements. Jim is currently the Chair of Sustainable Energy at Imperial College and a founding member of the UK's Committee on Climate Change, as well as being previously, of course, President of the Energy Institute. But it's Jim's role here as Chair of the Scottish Government's Just Transition Commission, which is going to talk to us today, with the aim of advising about a net zero economy that is the Commission is tasked with helping Scottish ministers to grow an inclusive net zero economy that also helps to support Scotland's contribution towards climate change mitigation and actually its removal from impact by 2045. And Jim has led uh, the development of uh, a couple of reports from the Commission, actually, one most recently around advice to ministers on recovery. And so without further ado, Jim, over to you so we can hear more. Thank you. Oh, OK, th th thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Louise. I hope you can hear me uh, at this at this point. So uh, Louise has actually uh, taken up much of my uh, first slide uh, here, so so I can I can skip over a lot of that. But I am actually going to focus on the Green Recovery Report, which the Commission uh, produced right at the end of July. But I think it's probably worthwhile saying a few words about what the Commission was set up for and how it's actually uh, w working, uh, first of all. So this is kind of repeating what uh, Louise has said. Uh, we got three charges from the Scottish ministers that set us up. They wanted practical, realistic and affordable advice uh, relating to maximising the opportunities for moving to a net zero economy by 2045 building on the existing strengths and assets, of which the oil and gas industry is obviously one, and understanding and mitigating the risks that could arise in terms of regional cohesion, employment, poverty, equalities, uh, you, uh, et cetera. Uh, 
Now, we have 12 commissioners uh, in total, and I think they're all somewhere in the top two pictures, pictures there. And they do come from a wide variety of backgrounds. So we have trade unions, we have business, we have NGOs, and we have some academics as well. It's a, it's a very, very widespread. And just to say, the Commission doesn't have a lot of analytical firepower. What we are relying on is the, the wisdom, the insights, or the, the prejudices, if you prefer, of the individual commissioners to put, to put our recommendations together. And I'm very pleased to say that we have managed to do this in a completely consensual uh, manner, ma uh, manner so far. Now, since we started at the beginning of uh, 20, 2019, we have deliberately, before we sort of closed down and went in, into online mode, we were systematically going around Scotland to explore different topics and listen to people. So just to give a, a flavour of that activity, top left-hand corner, we're standing outside the Coalfields Regeneration Trust in Concarden, where we ran a session about the rundown of the coal industry and the closure of the Langanet power station and how that, that was handled and expanded that into look at renewable energy. Bottom left, uh, it's down in the borders. We were having a session with farmers there uh, talking about some of the challenges uh, you go to of changing dietary choices, but also the opportunities associated with agriculture. And in the bottom at the centre, that's us at the Oil and Gas Technology Centre in Aberdeen, uh, where we're having a, an, an evening session with actually the Energy Institute Young Professionals Network. So there was a little bit of collaboration to, 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 put, that, uh, to, to, to put that together. So uh, and just the, the, the other pictures, top right-hand corner, that's a, p a piece of R&R &R once we visited Grangemouth uh, to look at uh, industrial opportunities in Scotland. So it gives you a flavour. We've been going around and, and talking to an awful lot of people. Now, in our general approach, in many other countries, think Poland, think Germany, think South Africa, just transition has been about how you get out of the coal industry. But coal the coal industry is in the rear view mirror in Scotland, so we have to think a bit more widely. So it's not just about coal, it's about other fossil fuels, and it's not just about the supply side, it's about people as consumers, and it's about communi uh, communities and the importance of place as well, which explains why we were going around the country. And we're also keen that, you, you know, Scotland is not a perfect place. There are lots of existing injustices, and we actually see this as an opportunity, the just transition as a way of addressing some of these existing uh, inequalities there at the moment. And we picked up land tenure as an issue with the farmers, questions of fair work and energy poverty are, are all in scope. And in the interim report, which we produced in February, we basically produced three very high-level principles that we you know, that we needed to follow for a just transition. So the first one is the very clear need for planning to move forward. Unplanned transitions are almost always unjust transitions. So the importance of planning is quite important. And we did pick up there that, for example, the Vision 2035 from Oil and Gas, Oil and Gas UK was 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 actually uh, quite a good example of that kind of planning, though it may need to be in, in some revision. If we're going to have a just transition, it needs to carry people with us. So engagement is a very important part of it. Again, explaining the way we've gone round Scotland. And for a recommendation really for government, making sure that equity is built into all climate policies from the start. So it's kind of a criterion uh, that, 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 that's applied. So these are some of the conclusions that are, are coming out. Now, in terms of the Green Recovery Report uh, that, uh, that, that we produced at the end of July, and this was produced at very high speed at the request of Rosanna Cunningham, the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and uh, Land Reform. And it's against the context of the very huge changes that uh, COVID has had and the implications for all aspects of society, not just energy, but all aspects. And of course, the background to that was the Scottish Government had to delay its uh, new climate change plan, which will not come out till the end of the year. And at the same time, the programme for government was also delayed, but we produced our report about two weeks before the new programme for government. And we're actually very pleased to see the degree to which the, the recommendations, recommendations were picked up. I mentioned also that COP26 
of course, uh, has been, uh, you know, has been delayed by a few a full year, which again we we are, we are thinking about. But basically, the ministers were extremely interested in thinking about as we move towards a simple reset of the economy and thought about a recovery from the current situation how climate change and a just climate uh, just response to climate change could be built into the uh, into the recovery from the current situation so we were asked to produce this report on a, on very short order for, for government and as i say we don't have a lot of analytical firepower so we were relying on the insights of, of our of our of our commissioners in in, in doing that um so when we when we thought about this, uh, we decided to identify what we called a set of hot spots uh, where we thought were of particular concern uh, in, moving forward, which were priorities for action. And hot spot number one, which uh, you know, other people have picked up, is the question of young people entering the labour market for the first time. They're at risk of poorer outcomes, and for those that are still in education, the risk of increasing inequalities. So this was one, the first hot spot we picked up. The second hot spot related to transport. So we 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 saw very significant changes in transport patterns. So the use of public transport has fallen dramatically. The use of cars fell dramatically at first, but has tended to return again. But we have seen increases in walking and cycling. And there are actually inequality issues like that because, because women and people on low incomes are disproportionately more likely to use public transport and it has, has had its impacts on access. So transport was one area that we picked up. The oil and gas sector uh, was our third hot spot, and obviously the, the, the very dramatic falls in, the, in oil prices with implications for activity in the North Sea was something we needed to consider. And we wanted to think about how the, the skills, the competence, the capacity that Scotland and the rest of the UK could be, has built up could be redeployed in the context of a just transition to a low carbon economy. And the final hotspot was the, the rural economy, and I should say parts of the rural economy, because in fact the food chain, the, the food chain ha, ha, has actually stood up rather well. It's more around the hospitality sector that you've seen the, 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 the difficulties uh, springing up for the rural economy. But again, there are opportunities in a green recovery. And I won't go into, into detail here, but we picked up opportunities around tree planting, and peatland restoration as areas where there were significant opportunities in the rural economy. So, in thinking about uh, the recommendations we produced for ministers, we uh, we set out uh, three criteria basically. Will it help set Scotland on a pathway to net zero by 2020 40, 45? Uh, Will it uh, help those who may have been hardest hit by the effect of, 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 the, of the COVID crisis? Can we help it? And will it be a just and a fair recovery? And it's worthwhile saying that uh, it, it, you know, items uh, one and two were already part of the consideration of the Just Transition Commission. And there are other bodies around Scotland, for example, the Advisory Group on Economic Recovery that Benny Higgins chaired, which were considering at criteria one and three together. But the unique task of us was to think about all three criteria at the, at the same time. And uh, I'll, I'll, I won't go on too long, but uh, just to say these are examples of the recommendations uh, that that we came up in three, partic three particular areas. And it's worthwhile saying we actually debated a little bit what makes a good recommendation for government. And we kind of uh, came up with a kind of a Goldilocks principle that the recommendations should not be so high level and vague that they're unactionable for a minister on a Monday morning, but neither should they be so detailed that a civil servant can pick holes in them uh, and, and shoot them down before you get started. So this sort of medium level principle was one that we applied. Now, our first example was very much what we saw as, as the uh, no-brainer, which is boosting investment in warmer homes. You can turn around that quickly. It's absolutely essential for getting to a net zero target, and it can build up employment quite quickly. So this was one that many groups have picked up on. 
in terms of transport, we we picked up on on the bus issue, and I have to say this wasn't entirely picked up in the in the programme for government. But we were very con con conscious of the fact that Scotland has a good competence in manufacturing buses with Alexander Dennis, for example, which has been particularly badly hit by the you know, the, the fall in orders for, for buses as a result of changed transport patterns. So our sort of flag waving one is that the government should order a, a fleet of electric buses for COP26 next year, uh, which the, the government still has the opportunity to do if, if, it, if it wants to wants to pick that up. And the third example was maintaining and creating new jobs for oil and gas workers. And I'll, I've got another slide on this one, since, since uh, the, the, there's a little bit, bit more uh, detail and it's more relevant, I think, to the uh, many of the, the people who, who are on this call. So we broke the oil and gas recommendations down into six parts. And the the first uh, the, the the first one was really perhaps the more the more backwards looking one, where there's the five the next five are forward looking, but they fit together because it will take time to convert skills and competences into the new carbon economy. But in the, in the new context, there is a, there is a, a big need to move on with a decommissioning program, which will employ skills for plugging and abandonment in the North Sea. And what's out for all of these recommendations, we're particularly indebted to Colette Cohen, uh, who runs the Oil and Gas Technology Centre, who's our kind of oil and gas person uh, you know, on, on the Commission. And the other ones, are, 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 you know, I can flex it quickly. Uh, offshore wind is seen as, as a major opportunity where some skills can be moved over. But we also wanted uh, decarbonisation clusters. We're very interested in hydrogen and carbon capture utilisation storage as, as a way of opening up opportunities. Um, yeah, so, so that's saying this also ties up to the visits we did to Grangemouth, investment in facilitating infrastructure in ports and harbours, and direct investment in manufacturing facilities. Now, I might just say two remarks just around the, the side of that. As I said, we don't have much analytical fi uh, firepower, but we acknowledge that the devil is in the detail of a lot of these recommendations. So one of the other recommendations we've made in the interim report is much greater attention to detailed skills mapping, to understand how the skills in, in perhaps more traditional industries can be, be redeployed into new areas, but it needs that the devil is in the detail, which is not something we've been able to do. And the other point I would like to like to flag up is the question that has uh, troubled, especially the trade union members of the Commission, is that green investment does not always convert into green jobs. And so we also have some recommendations about trying to pursue domestic content uh, in, in new investments as they go forward, which means uh, how the uh, two things really how the procurement is conducted, but also building up the skills in the supply chain so that there are competences to meet the needs. But there are definitely some institutional things needed looked at. We were made very well aware. Uh, as we conducted our work, the fact that, for example, in some of the offshore wind farms, uh, that jobs were being conducted by non-UK citizens at below minimum wage, which of course directly troubled a lot of our a, a lot of our trade union representatives, and one that needs to be considered. So uh, this is my very 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 last slide, to, just just to, to to try and and sum it up. Uh, in our very first interim report, uh, the civil servant who's helping us in the Secretariat included this throwaway sentence somewhere on the 15th page of the report. But all of the commissioners thought it was so good that it is now the slogan that we, we use on the website. So it's really to summarise what we're doing. It's to make sure the benefits of climate change action are shared widely. We don't unfairly burden those least able to pay or those whose livelihoods are at risk as the economy, economy changes because the economy is surely shifting and changing. And I'll finish it off uh, at that point, uh, Louise. Thanks very much. And I will attempt to relinquish control of the screen, which I understand I need to do. 
Thanks ever so much, Jim. That was that was a great tour around uh, uh, the most recent work that you've been doing, uh, and, 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 a, and a very helpful indication of some of the thinking and the recommendations that have have been made. I like the the fact that they're all Monday morning and perfectly actionable. Uh, let's see, it'll be, it'll be fantastic to see. Um, I should also say to people that are on the call today, you can uh, get access to um, the advice of the Green Recovery Report and also the interim report from the Commission. Um, so, uh, by all means, you know, if you just quick Google that, it will come up and there's a downloadable PDF that you can uh, read through at your leisure. But if you have your questions for Jim, uh, let's pop them into the, the chat box too, and uh, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll be able to pick some of those up in a in a wee while. Thanks again, Jim. Okay, now moving on to our next speaker this morning, who I introduced to you is Dr. Andy Samuel, who is chief executive, as you will all know, of the Oil and Gas Authority. The OGA was set up in 2014 and is the UK's oil and gas industry regulator, working with the industry, of course, to maximise economic recovery of UK oil and gas, whilst also enabling the UK government's commitment to reach net zero emissions by 2050 now uh, as part of that uh, remit. Andy previously held a number of international leadership positions during his 20 year career with BG Group, and he also serves on the boards of uh, the Oil and Gas Technology Centre, which you've heard mentioned with a shout out already this morning, and Opportunity North East's Energy Board. In August, the OGA, in collaboration with Ofgem, the Crown Estate and Bays, published the UKCS Energy Integration Final Report. And that's what Andy's going to talk to you about today. The report highlights the possibility of integrating our offshore energy systems, including oil and gas, renewables, hydrogen and carbon capture and storage for a new energy future in Scotland. It's a huge opportunity uh, to deliver a significant contribution to the UK's total carbon reduction requirements by 2050 and uh, a very exciting opportunity that Andy's going to tell us more about this morning. So over to you, Andy. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you very much, Louise. Good morning, everyone. Uh, delighted to be on this panel, and uh, thank you, Jim. That was uh, brilliant to hear firsthand the uh, the excellent work of the Just Trans Just Transition. I think very aligned actually with some of the things that I'll be talking about. So, Katrina, if we can go to the first slide, please. Um, as that's coming up, look, we we all know it's been a a, a tremendously difficult year, and uh, we're all very familiar with. I think it's often termed the double whammy. Uh, the, the the twin effects of the the pandemic and the the crash in, in both um, oil and gas prices. I think what people forget though is there's been a lot of hard work by industry, by government, we'd argue by ourselves as well, to actually get some of the fundamentals in a far better shape, which has led us able to deal with these issues. I think far better than we would have been otherwise. But that's not to understate just how difficult it is, and there's still a long way to go. But if we look at fundamentals like efficiency, production efficiency up at 80%, and that was below 60% only five years ago. Likewise, fundamentals like you know, operating costs in a far better place. We have a very competitive and actually stable fiscal regime. And this is, we continue to attract uh, new investors into the basin, which is vital. And we continue to actually make some very substantial discoveries. There's a lot going on also with culture change. Now, what about net zero? Uh, astonishingly to me, some people describe this as a headwind. To me, it's the biggest imperative of our time. The climate emergency is real and we all need to act quickly. And if we're smart, we can turn it into an opportunity. And I'll say a lot more about that. Uh, if we can go on, please, Katrina. And um, before I do that, though, I just wanted to reflect a little bit on some good work that we're leading through various task forces and also doing ourselves and collaborating with, with a whole range of stakeholders to try and get us through this crisis. And it is really hard. And we're very aligned with the trade unions and very concerned about people's livelihoods, the potential massive loss of jobs, uh, of no fault of anyone. And I think Jim mentioned planning. And I think more than ever, we need to be planning multiple scenarios and really looking to a range of different futures. Right now, there's a lot of work with government on a, a North Sea transition deal. This will un actually underpin a lot of green recovery work that we'll talk about. Uh, we hope this is committed to in this, this parliament, but we hope to see it quicker than that, hopefully towards the end of this year. As part of that, there's been some great work on a global underwater hub. This is recognizing the value of the blue economy, 
and synergies with offshore wind, but also marine defense, and many other areas. The work of the just transition highlighted decommissioning, albeit as a kind of backward looking, but necessary step and a, and a, and a route to support jobs through this downturn. We fully agree. We've looked at, we screened 26 different options. Uh, a task force came up with this 100 million loan that's being worked through Bayes and Treasury at the moment may form part of the, uh, the North Sea transition deal. There's also um, ha has been an increasing talk about the need to, to diversify and export. We have amazing skills that are valuable across the whole of the world. Um, some tremendous work through the Supply Chain Exports Task Force has identified almost a trillion of project activity coming up the next few years. And, and a whole range of webinars have been held to connect people with the skills and the, the capital um, and I think that's that's going to start to really pay pay forward. We're not just looking at this 100 million loan. We've identified over 190, 190 open water wells waiting to be decommissioned. We are not going to carry on allowing people just to put this off. So consents will not be extended. We need to kind of restart work where when we can, safely can through this pandemic. Likewise, we've worked with 20 operators looking at their portfolio of small projects that can hopefully get started now and, and often in different ways working with the supply chain. And we're, we're encouraged. We're seeing some good exemplars work restarting. I've talked about a more robust approach uh, to consents. We're applying the same to licenses. Um, a few months ago, when we were at the heart of the pandemic, we, we took a, a flexible approach. But now we really need to see work starting when it can be done safely. We're very active um, working with a range of partnerships where things get blocked to unblock them and kind of restart projects and uh, and get things out of the way. And there's also a lot of scenario planning because we recognize that things may still get worse. Um, you know, there's breaking news right now about you know, new government measures coming in. So we all need to be flexible and agile and, and take it day by day, but, but plan for a range of scenarios. Excitingly, though, we see a lot of mileage in what we call the green recovery, hopefully very similar, as you'll hear, to, to what Jim's been talking about. So if we can, can go forward, please. So this was a bit of work we actually have been doing over the last couple of years. We, we've done it in phases. I'm delighted to be working very closely here with with the Department for Business and Energy and Industrial Strategy, Crown Estate, uh, Ofgem, and many others. And this was looking at opportunities, treating the UKCS as, as a real asset, not just the decommissioning liability, but an asset for the future. And, and how could we take different industries that had previously been working arguably in silos and actually look at, if you can treat it as a whole system, what opportunities do you see? What extra value can be created? And what are the barriers to actually getting after some of the visions that I'll, I'll talk through? But I wanted to start with the headlines, which, which we actually found quite remarkable. Essentially, the UK continental shelf by 2050 can provide 60% of the UK's total um, greenhouse gas abatement. Um, this is massive. 30% of that comes through what we call the energy integration technologies. So offshore electrification, blue hydrogen, and CCS particularly. And then another 30% largely from offshore wind power, but potentially tidal and others. So the electrification, for example, looks small, but we think by 2025, um, the, there's an opportunity to reduce emissions by 20% and an extra 20%, so 40% by 2030. And we are seeing some real projects getting some momentum right now. I'll talk more about this, so if we go on to the next slide, please. So this isn't just a vision. This is actually something that we can see real pathways. Jim talked about plans that this can actually start to get real traction through 2025 and 2030. We've already identified 60 projects. We're working closely with about 20 um, on detailed plans. And what are the barriers to really getting after this? As I say, electrification, um, there are consortia um, operators, uh, infrastructure owners, supply chain companies starting to work together on real projects. And you need to work this at scale to actually make the economics work. Uh, so we're, we're excited what we're seeing there. Likewise, CCS, you'll know that there are 
six main industrial clusters across the UK. They need decarbonizing. We have some of the best conditions in the, U the UK globally. We have some of the best carbon stores. We have existing infrastructure. We have the skills. We need to, we need to prove that this can work. This is a gift to the world. You know, this is what the UK can do. We need to be proud about this, and we need to have a good story about, about this leading up to, to COP26. And then it gets really exciting as we look at energy hubs and a whole different way of combining these technologies. And the innovation here is massive, but also look at the potential capex. You know, shortly there can be a tipping point and there will be more investment in this green recovery than the traditional E&P, but the two are required. And we're not saying here this is the end of oil and gas because we still need it. And we've done a lot of work with the Committee for Climate Change and out to 2050 still, we do need oil, we need gas. The carbon footprint of imported gas is higher than, than indigenous gas. So through this transition that will go over, will go on for decades, we need to be working these together. If I can move on, please. So whilst we still need oil and gas, we actually need to uh, to drive down emissions and we need to be doing some things in the, the short term. Uh, we're often asked, how do you uh, reconcile MER UK, so maximizing economic recovery with net zero? We've done a lot of work on this. We've done a lot of thinking. We don't see the conflict. We actually see that they are necessary to go together. Industry's license to operate is under great threat. It needs to prove that it's actually part of the solution. And part of this actually is embracing net zero. But like I say, whilst we still need oil and gas, we should do it from the lowest possible emission sources. And right now, um, we're driving down the, uh, the emissions intensity across the UK. We'll be introducing a new net zero stewardship expectation so that we can be crystal clear of what we expect from license holders going forward. As part of this, we were very pleased that Oil & Gas UK took our initial Vision 2035 and turned it into Roadmap 2035. And as part of that, there are some quite demanding targets on reducing emissions. 50% by 2030, 90% by 2040 is impressive. The only thing that we would like to see over and above that is a nearer term target. Um, so we're looking for targets really out to 2020, 2025, because we know that MDs typically change their tenure quite quickly. And, and I think this industry is gonna be under the spotlight and we can't wait till 2030 to demonstrate real progress on these key areas. We will help. We've developed some quite sophisticated uh, benchmarks, uh, taking a, a huge amount of data and turning it into some, some substantial KPIs. And we'll be increasingly public with this. Uh, the next couple of weeks, we're gonna um, publish our first ever flaring and benchmark, flaring and venting benchmark report. If we can uh, go on, please, thank you. So in conclusion, um, I just wanted to kind of step back and uh, reflect where is we as an industry. I think the eyes of the world are going to be on the oil and gas industry in the North Sea very much uh, in this period leading up to COP26. Uh, we have a sector of state who is, you know, managing the, the, the Bay's department, but also as the president for COP26 is managing these two things, but he's expecting that you know, we are going to lead a charge and show that this is an industry very much in transition. And how do we do that? We need to be working on all fronts. I've talked about the need to, to reduce our carbon footprint now. There's some excellent work ongoing. Um, I've met with uh, 16 operating MDs and their teams just this year going through their plans, and, and I'm impressed. There's a lot of best practices. There's a lot of opportunity, as we've done with safety previously, to leverage that and, and share and transfer and improve rapidly. But I also think visibly, we need to demonstrate that things like CCS, blue hydrogen, ultimately green hydrogen, are not just a pipe dream. We need to turn them into a reality and we need to do it quick. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what government does to support that through the North Sea transition deal. But I'm also really looking for industry to be brave take a lead. And I think this is what's going to attract the next generation of talent that we sorely need. If we've learned one thing this year, it's that the world is changing real quick and we need to be agile and adaptive. So look forward to your questions. Thank you again. Delighted to, to be on this panel.
Andy, thanks ever so much indeed. That was a, a, a really interesting sort of quick tour through what I know is a very full report uh, with a lot more detail on it. And, and again, publicly accessible for those that want to go and uh, and delve a little bit deeper. But we have had have some questions come in and uh, there's still also we've got time for you to post some more uh, into the chat box if you so wish um, and, uh, and direct them through to the different participants or to everybody. It's entirely up to you. Um, let me start off with a question, the same question to both of you that's come in. Um, we're talking about the urgency, we're talking about the pace of the need for change, uh, talking about moving from talk to action. What, in your view, uh, is, the, is the, the, the most important thing we do next to either remove barriers or, or get, uh, in, in your eyes, the most important next steps to, to actually happen so that we move from talk to action? Andy, do you want to start? Yeah, I, I think um, as, as a, demonst a dem demonstrator of visible change, I think CCS would be a really good next step. Um, the government's done some good work recently, published its uh, response on two important consultations. One was on the business models, the other was on reuse and uh, liabilities. There's been some really good work, therefore. So I think that gives investors a lot more clarity of the direction of travel. Um, what we need to do, therefore, is see investors connecting up with the, uh, the emitters and actually coming up with some schemes. There are some promising schemes being worked. In Scotland, of course, there's ACORN, there's Net Zero Teesside, Zero Carbon Hub, Zero Carbon Humber, and also HiNet. I would love to see all four of those go ahead. I, th I, I see no reason why they shouldn't. There's a real need. And I think this would be a real visible, exciting demonstration of an industry very much in transition. And when you think about that tension between sort of government support and investment upfront into such projects, as, and, and, and some would say that's part of the reason why they haven't taken flight in and the UK being a gift to the world in, in harnessing this opportunity so far, uh, to quote you, what, what do you think it is that will make uh, an investor uh, take that step forward? Uh, and, and do you think indeed that needs to be with government involvement or not? So I know of at least uh, one consortia that's looking to very much reduce how much their uh, government support and, and take control themselves. They want to demonstrate, uh, as I've said, that they're, they're in action. They recognise that their licensed operators is, is under more scrutiny than ever. Um, and I mean, it, it's a question of carbon price, um, but different companies take different views on that. Um, but I think, you know, as we've seen with other technologies, when you make a start, you do get down the learning curve pretty quickly, but you have to make a start. Now, having said that, you know, government has, you know, consistently um, remained committed to the 800 million um, fund. So, you know, it's recognised that there, there may be a need, depending on the particular business model, to kind of kickstart a few of these projects. But I think the more investors can be creative, and, and be self-sufficient, the better. And there, and I think connecting therefore directly with these major sort emission sources and working things bilaterally. You know, if you can do things without government, uh, I would very much recommend that. Yeah. No. And Jim, what about you? Yeah. yeah your your follow-up question, uh, Louise, was very much uh, along the lines I, I I wanted to answer. I think mobilising investment is, is the absolute absolute key to it. And just to say, I agree with Andy about CCS. We need to to get to get on to get on with that. I do think uh, you know, there is a role for the public sector, but it ought to be in terms of facilitating and encouraging the flow of private money to make it happen. Now, uh, we were very interested and talked a lot with the Scottish National Investment Bank, for example, when it was when it was set up, whose role is very much, to, uh, as it were, to lubricate the flow of private money rather than to pay for everything. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, as part of the discussions, uh, net zero and just transition were actually built into its articles of association. So it's, it's very much, much, much got a role there. And I would also echo Andy's point about a carbon tax. Unless there's a price on carbon, it's not actually going to happen. This is particularly important. There may be other parts of the economy, like the rural economy, energy efficiency, where you can do it with regulation, the other matters. In this part of it, where it affects the energy supply side, if you don't have a carbon tax or a carbon price through another mechanism, then it's not going to happen. Uh, so I think this is absolutely critical. 
And do you, Jim, have a view about whether that needs to be a global uh, mechanism or something that can work on a regional basis? Uh, well, I, j just to say, in terms of a global mechanism, I think dream on uh, would, would be my view. The, the Paris Agreement, you know, moved to a very bottom-up architecture for international, so it will take place regionally. I cannot see any prospect of a global crisis. And we have a, a question that's come in that's related that's talking about um, where do you think ultimately the additional cost of CCS operations will fall within the economy uh, and, and, and who will they be borne by um, and what is the mechanism that, that pays for them? That's from John. Uh, well, 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 if that's that's for me, I mean, ultimately, the consumer is going to pay for it. Uh, you know, if it's private money that's going to flow, obviously, to the extent that the public sector does, it will be through the tax system. But ultimately, if the majority of the money comes in the private sector, consumers will pay for it. But we have to remember they're paying if for a good cause. Uh, there are costs associated with climate change as well in terms of impacts, and you need to value the benefits and the costs. As, as well as thinking about how, how you know how it's paid. So, so Jim, how does that then get reconciled with you know? Because one of my questions was who's ultimately going to pay for this, and and you know, always expecting the the word consumer to to appear uh, near the top of the list. How does that get reconciled with the work that you've been doing around the the just transition and in, in increasing the trying to build in equality to the design of policies and therefore any instruments and mechanisms that flow from that. Yeah, well, well, of course, there isn't one person called the consumer who pays. It's a, it's a very diverse set of consumers out there. And that's actually right at the heart of what we're doing. It, it, it's about thinking. So, for example, in Scotland, the question of the rural economy. So one of the other areas where we had a lot of recommendations was in, about investment in digital infrastructure, for example, that would allow people in rural areas to get more engaged in the economy very directly. Uh, the question uh, that's why we picked on buses, actually, again, because the, the rural economy, economy is there. I mean, I do think uh, one, one question that you might want to ask, I think, which we will be asking, is whether things like subsidies for renewable energy are paid for through electricity prices or are paid through for general taxation. And you know, the, there are big implications for social equality and how it's paid for because of the regressive effects, effectively, of, of putting it on electricity prices, plus the fact that, that many measures that improve the efficiency of gas fall on the electricity consumer, and many of the people who use electricity for heating are, are the poorest people. And so this is a, a big issue that we are thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um so I've got a, another question that's come in here, um, uh, Andy. It says here, um, have you explored the role that Scotland can play in becoming a larger exporter of energy, uh, thinking about sort of this integration with renewable electricity, green, blue, hydrogen and so on? And I know there's material in the report, but may maybe you could touch on and expand on that a little bit, please. Sure. Um, it, it gets very exciting very quickly. and. Um... Certainly, I know of one operator who's having serious conversations with a, a major New York private equity firm, and I, I completely agree with what Jim says. You know, this is all about creating the right conditions for investors, but they're seriously looking at massive um, green hydrogen generation. You know, let's say from the kind of Shetland type area, and, and potentially a kind of ring main taking hydrogen all the way to continental Europe. And I see no reason why that couldn't become a reality. Um, it needs a, a kind of master plan. In the OGA, we start with area plans. We're now looking at regional plans, but this needs almost like a, a national hydrogen plan. And again, I think the government's going to be coming out with a, a hydrogen strategy. But clearly, we've seen other, com you know, other countries like Germany, the Netherlands, taking this very, very seriously as an opportunity. But again, we have some of the best conditions huge UK continental shelf, lots of space, fantastic uh, wind conditions. So, you know, I'd really like to see us take the lead on areas like this and export it. And when we're talking about exporting, I think the other key thing, though, is actually to make sure, and I think Jim touched on this, you know, and the trade unions raise it, we need to build the skills and capabilities within the UK. So I'm pleased to be working with Syrian, Syrian Wood and others through Opportunity Northeast on the potential energy transition zone in Aberdeen. But a large part of that is actually anchoring manufacturing 
for some of these new components and new requirements actually within the northeast of Scotland, we can then actually start to export that globally. Because I think, you know, we if we can take a march, the rest of the world will follow. And there's a, a related question that came in for you on that point, Andy, I think, um, saying uh, there's a concern around reskilling of employees in the UK CS, concerns around the average age of the, the workforce, and also around the lack of or reduced interest in young, uh, young people in a career in oil and gas companies. Presumably, is that something that in your one northeast you see and you pick up on as a as a and, and obviously in, in and around where you are based? Is that a sense of, of urgency that you, you you feel around this issue in terms of the timeline for some of this to happen? Yeah, I think very much. Um, so Jim talked about the need for a kind of almost like a skill strategy. There is the uh, skill energy skills alliance is working that some really good work through Robert Gordon's university, Paul Delu and others working with the PETO have actually now mapping very at a very granular level the existing skills and what's going to be required in the future through this energy integration uh, vision and how we kind of marry the two together. Um, it is not a like for like match. I, I don't think it's necessarily a question of age. I think it's a question of mindset. Um, you know, people need to be open to learning new things. I don't see why they can't do that at any point in their career. Clearly, digital and things, you know, we're already going through that transition. And if anything, the pandemic has only accelerated that. So if we can do that on digital, why can't we do it uh, elsewhere? Although there's still questions about the pace. Uh, and I think it is it is a matter now of getting on with it. I think in terms of attracting the next generation, this is really important. And I think Oil and Gas UK are looking at the kind of the whole kind of um, culture. And I think, you know, Louise, you and I have talked about things like inclusion and diversity. And I, I'm very pleased I took up your recommendation and now benefit from reverse entering. And I think we all need to kind of think a lot more, you know, what the next generation want, what kind of um, culture they want, you know, what industry they want to work in. But again, for me, it's a leadership and mindset thing. Um, but in my advice to anyone joining the industry is be careful what company you join. If you want a long career, I mean, I think what BP are doing, for example, and Bernard Looney's leadership it is very interesting and very exciting. Uh, and it's in contrast to some other companies. So I would just say there are some good choices. And I think it's going to be a very exciting time. Um, but who knows exactly how it's going to play out. But I am looking forward to what the uh, Energy Skills Alliance come up come up with and I think they'll hopefully be very public with their findings because it's a key question. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Andy, on, on, on a range of those points. And, and the Energy Institute has a network of thousands of young energy professionals, and a lot of those are based in uh, in, in Scotland. Uh, and only yesterday, actually, in our Generation 2050 project, where we've been running a survey which designs a manifesto for leadership in the sector for the looking ahead uh, for those who are within the first five years of their career. And already over a thousand young professionals have, have taken part in that. And yesterday they had a webinar talking about what, what leadership should look like and, and uh, how it should be and, and whether or not if your values align with the company's values, then then that's the, the place for you to be. So I and interestingly, we did have a question come in uh, asking you directly whether you thought about BP's partnering with city, uh, the City Council of Aberdeen on the net zero uh, ambition was uh, raising awareness or just a PR coup? So I, I've had the benefit of um, working with Bernard over the years, Bernard Looney. Um, we used to uh, hold him account, you know, for, for what BP were doing in the North Sea and and, and, and always found very straightforward um, dialogue. Uh, and actually, I found Bernard always was very keen to listen and learn, which was, you know, remarkable humility. And I think BP through BP Week last week have been very transparent and very clear on their direction of travel. They clearly now need to deliver on that. But I think credit for them for, you know, that they haven't left themselves much wriggle room. So I think it's going to be a very interesting kind of five years as, and I wish them every success. We will do everything we can to support them. I think for our industry, it's exactly the right thing. Um, obviously, BP tried this under Lord Brown, you know, a few decades ago, and I think Lord Brown was kind of almost too enlightened or too, too, you know, future thinking. But the time, surely, if, it, if it's not time now, then when? So really, we need to get on with this. Um, so no, I, 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 I think credit to Aberdeen Council. Uh, again, there's some really interesting work in this area. We could become 
you know, a key part of the hydrogen coast, I think that there are already some good seeds to kind of build on. So, um, yeah, I think we all need to be brave and innovate. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think um, one of the things I was also told, because uh, that was the time around of our, our IP week at the Energy Institute in February when, when you were um, uh, with us previously, and I was told that there were 12,000 applications from young people looking for work in that particular that single organisation after they announced their ambition. So that was before right. even full strategy was published. So it certainly captured uh, attention uh, and, and imagination of many. Uh, and as you say, let, let's, if it isn't the time to do it now, then it never will be. Jim, there's a question that's come in for you, which is um, probably, probably as a result of you referring to the sort of the hotspot around the challenges in of land uh, and also the economy. And the, the question is orientated around um, whether or not there's a, the appropriate sort of institutional arrangements uh, assuming it's not a job for the OTA, but it's 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 a job for better connectivity across all sectors to achieve a net zero ambition. Obviously, we've been focused a, a little bit on the conversation around the oil and gas industry and moving to to a more integrated, all encompassing one. But what about some of the other aspects of the work, the, the the sort of the community engagement, the discussions that you've been having? Do you see that level of connectivity between regulators, between industry sectors, between consumers across all those other sectors where we need to get to net zero? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the sad difficulty is that everything is connected to everything else. So, but unfortunately, we do need to break this down into manageable bits, I think, I think, to, to get on with things. And I imagine Andy and the OGA have a, a, a big enough in tray without taking on nature based solutions as well would, would be my kind of suggestion. I mean, one each sector has its own complexities that until you start to buddy into it, you never really start to realise picture of us meeting with the farmers down in the borders. And I had never understood till then or even appreciated the fact that there was an interaction between multi-generational agricultural leases and inheritance laws that acted as an obstacle uh, to you know, taking nature-based solutions in agriculture with tree planting. Uh, you know, it, it's incredibly complicated. And I do think we need to break it, break it down a bit. So I do think the challenges of, of land and the nature-based solutions have a quite a different character. Uh, you know, having sat together with an evidence session with the Scottish Landowners Association, which is the big landowners versus the community trusts that are trying to buy up land at the moment, this is an area that just has all sorts of institutional complexity uh, that I am somewhat humbled by. I used to think the energy sector was difficult. I think land is much harder, actually. Uh, so, so Andy, you're lucky just dealing with oil and gas and CCS. That's the easy bit. <laughs> So there's an opportunity for us to bang some of the heads together there between the two and have some onshore energy development then, Jim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, the way to compromise and come together. <laughs> there's also a question that relates building on that, Jim, um, where um, somebody is saying uh, the recent Citizens Assembly report expressed some um, scepticism around CCUS. Did the Commission identify anything that echoes that wariness or um, any, any discussions around sort of community engagement that might win people around? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I know. Yeah, I noted the Citizens Assembly approach and to one of the advantages that the UK has in carbon capture and storage, which Andy mentioned, I would also mention the question of public acceptability. Uh, there's a lot of hostility to carbon storage underground in continental Europe, places like uh, uh, Germany especially. And the Netherlands had it, especially when they started off CCS by trying to store it under Rotterdam, which which didn't go down too well with, with, with people. Having the storage capacity offshore is actually a big advantage. And I, I think it, that's another reason why it makes there's a good case for proceeding in the UK. But uh, I mean, persistently over a period of years, people have shown a, when you go to citizens assemblies group in similar sorts of settings, there is um, scepticism expressed about what you might call the higher tech solutions to climate change. And bioenergy actually gets a lot of pushback as well uh, when, when you go to these. 
But you know, the work with IPCC that I'm doing quite clearly shows that unless you employ these higher tech supply side solutions and get on with aspects of bioenergy, there is no way that net zero is going to be attainable or we're going to stay within the Paris warming limits. So I think that, you know, that there's really quite a big challenge there about uh, you know ex ex explaining to people uh, how warming limits will be unattainable unless these more these more technology based solutions are, are are going to be 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 taken on. But I think it's a real challenge for the oil and gas industry because there is an almost cultural divide at the moment. There are many people out there looking to the world's more extinction rebellion end of the spectrum who think that anything the oil and gas industry does must be bad, regardless of whether it actually contributes to climate change solutions. And I think you, you, it, you really, I think the industry needs to face it. I think the, the people I talk to in it do understand that issue and are moving on. But I think it's a real, real challenge at the moment because it is, uh, there's a little bit of a culture wars over it, uh, which, which may need to be addressed as well. I can say that as a, a kind of independent academic uh, uh, with, with, with that particular hat on. Yeah, but I, I think it plays to the point about sort of community engagement and building trust, doesn't it? If you if you're not very good at listening, uh, and I would argue that potentially you know, some organisations have not been great at listening. They've just been busy ploughing on doing the doing the thing that they do, uh, and and creating economic well being in other ways. Uh, and then the minute sort of your I guess Andy mentioned social licence to operate comes under. Uh, uh, the the spotlight. Then, if you don't use the the years in proportion, then um, you you start to fall behind. I think if you if you're not prepared, and also you have to be prepared to listen to people that don't want to agree. You know, listening to people that agree with you isn't really that helpful in this in this context. I think, Andy, there was a question that came in about um, lots of talk about the uh, potential for wind power uh, that you mentioned, but not not very much said about wave power. So, just wondering if you can say anything about sort of wave wave energy resources and whether that was covered in your report. Uh, we didn't go into that in in great detail. Um... I remember a few years ago, uh, there were quite a few trials that it looked promising. Um, we would be delighted if, uh, you know, we're certainly not not here to exclude anything. I know one or two operators that actually have come up, and I think the, the Oil and Gas Technology Centre supported this, came up with some trials for kind of local power for platforms. And I think those trials have actually worked quite well. So, um, yeah, I, I would like to think it will be part of the mix along with Tidal. Um, and uh, certainly the schemes we look at don't exclude things. And um, so right now we're working at a central North Sea electrification that is looking um, for kind of DC connection either through Norway or the UK, but deliberately designed so that it can incorporate floating offshore wind because that, that needs to be kind of kick-started. I don't see any reason why it couldn't also incorporate offshore um, wave, but I'll, I'll take that forward to the team. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, go on, Jim. Come back in. Uh, the, this was specifically on on, on uh, the, the the wave energy point, and I think it's a particularly difficult technology uh, because ten or fifteen years ago, I think the proponents exaggerated the ma maturity of the technology, and in a way, governments encouraged them to do it by saying they had to be close to market in order to get the money. So there was a sort of a vicious circle that exaggerated how close the technology was. So I think with Wave Energy Scotland, it was the right thing to take it back down the TRL level uh, and, and start at a more fundamental level again and be more realistic about where it was in terms of, of maturity. I just agree with Andy. I think uh, you know, some of the, the potential for wave energy may not lie at the multi-megawatt scale, you know, like with the Palamas devices, but with more uh, modest devices that are applied in niche situations. And I noticed that somebody has just said on the chat that tidal energy uh, is perhaps more optimistic, and I would uh, I would agree there because it's kind of got a settled design. There's a standard design that you can work on, whereas with wave energy, there's a plethora of devices, and we haven't made progress around any of them, which you really need to get a settled design, like you did with uh, horizontal axis, or, uh, you know, onshore wind turbines, for example. 
Thanks, Jim. Thanks for that addition. So we're, we're coming close to the end of our time, unfortunately, and I know there's lots more co questions coming through the chat. So maybe we'll try and sort of coordinate some answers to some of those and share those with participants subsequently if we can. So apologies that we can't get to uh, to all of the questions that you've posed. One final brief remark from from both of you. If uh, if 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 you were in charge and you could start this ball rolling, what would be the first thing you would do to make this all happen and go from talk to action? Jim? Well, 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 the, well, the sad answer with net zero is is there isn't any one thing you need to pick. You need to get 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 on or, or, or with everything, and it needs it needs a blend. You know, especially thinking about green recovery, you want to get on with some things that have a very fast fast return and energy efficiency. That is one I approve, but you mustn't neglect building the foundations for action. You know, in the years in the future, and that's where the hydrogen, the CCS, the energy integration comes in. So it needs a bit of a portfolio. That's a wriggle out answer. Yeah, not at all, not at all. Andy, how about you? Well, I mean, that, that, that's a hard one to finish with. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say two things. One, fully agree with Jim. Two, I look, look I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of dialogue. We, we need to move at pace. I think you said yourself, we need to listen more. And you can, you know, we need, if I was the Secretary of State or PM, get all key stakeholders, I mean, a real diverse diagonal kind of cross section together. You know, a couple of weeks. I know it's very hard in the middle of a pandemic, but we could do it virtually and just listen and thrash us out. What are the barriers? Why are things still a bit slow? What would it take to really fast track this, harness the skills, the talent we've got, and let's get on with it? And I'm sure we could find real solutions. I think we are, but we could do it quicker. Completely agree. We have to go quicker. Uh, we are all out of time and I'm afraid we're all out of time this morning as well. So my thanks to both of you, Andy and to Jim, for giving up your time and sharing the detail of the reports, which I said are, are publicly available to all of you. Thank you for all of your questions. We'll try and pick up the, the balance of those subsequently uh, and, and communicate with you. So thanks for giving up your time. And finally, thanks also to our sponsors, who I mentioned at the beginning of the session, for helping us with the organisers be able to bring this webinar to you this morning. So keep well, everybody. Stay safe and uh, we'll see you again very soon. Thanks very much indeed. Have a good day. Bye.